first president, George Washington. Recent discoveries are shedding new light on this legendary figure, yielding startling facts about the original founding father. He's as familiar as the face on the dollar bill. George Washington, war hero, president, the father of his country. Most everyone knows this great man, or thinks they do. But we're continuing to learn that much of what we thought is fact is actually fiction. People made up things about George. Uh, during his lifetime, after his lifetime, there is an industry in falsifying George. His passion for freedom. We have this rhetoric and this dialogue of freedom. And he was there kidnapping people escaping slavery. Archaeologists working the dig site have found evidence of one of these traumatic events. Among the artifacts recently discovered at George Washington's childhood home, one item stands out, an object intimately linked with a secretive order. This is a, a regular middle 18th century English uh, molded clay pipe. But this one's special because it's got a Masonic crest on the inside. This strange emblem is the sign of the Freemasons, a global fraternity with medieval roots. Washington joins the Fredericksburg Lodge at age 20 and is an active participant. But the fraternity also opens new doors for him, allowing access to higher levels of society. He continues his networking through the Virginia militia, where he's presented with another vehicle for advancement. War. Today, George Washington is renowned as a fearless leader and brilliant military tactician. Some of that is true. His courage and bravery live up to the myth. The incident gives rise to a legend that he is protected by the great spirit and will never die in battle. During this period, Washington also embarks on another type of conquest, the courtship of his future wife. But even here, his passions are bound by his ambition. Although his marriage to Martha is told as one of the great American love stories, more than love fuels their relationship. At 26, Washington knows that marrying a rich widow will give him access to her estate. This means more land, slaves, and opportunity. And Martha Custis is one of the wealthiest widows in all of Virginia. By entering the shadowy world of espionage and deception, Washington reveals his more devious side. He's willing to blur ethical lines for a higher cause. But during his life, he faces an even greater moral dilemma, one that will test the boundaries of his passion for freedom. George Washington has long been painted as an idealist. A man who fought for freedom and liberty, his moral strength has rarely been questioned. But archaeologists have unearthed reminders that this freedom did not apply to all. These are cowrie shells. They're not found locally, they're found in Africa and in the Caribbean, and they're very important to people of Africa. Some of them are used for money, some of them are used for jewelry. These shells, found at Washington's childhood home, were likely brought here by slaves. They're a reminder of how much his livelihood depended on their labor. Washington was around slavery his entire life. He becomes an actual slave owner at age 11 when his father dies. He'll continue to acquire slaves into his adulthood. At the height of its production, 
His Mount Vernon estate staffs over 300 enslaved workers in both his house and fields. Washington expected his slaves to work six days a week from sunup to sundown. As he put it, I expect to reap the benefits of the labor myself. Even as president, he brings a contingent of slaves to Philadelphia, the current seat of government. They are held at the executive mansion, a precursor of today's White House. Recently, a team of archaeologists began excavating the site. What they found there surprised even them. I'm now standing at what would have been the entrance of an underground hallway or passage that would have been used primarily by servants and slaves. And it would have served to allow them access to the work areas in those two buildings and to keep them out of sight. This unknown passageway and other discoveries at the dig site have drawn new attention to Washington's relationship with slavery. In 1780, Pennsylvania passes the Gradual Abolition Act which demands that slaves kept for more than six months must be freed. Washington skirts this law by illegally shuttling individuals back and forth across state lines. But some of his slaves seek this freedom on their own by running away from captivity. Perhaps the most famous runaway slave was a seamstress by the name of Ona Judge, who was one of Martha's slaves. Ona learns that she's going to be given to one of Martha Washington's granddaughters. This means separation from her friends and family. The specter of being sold is one of the most agonizing and traumatic moments within the life of any enslaved person. Philadelphia, 1796. While George Washington dines at the presidential mansion, Ona Judge slips unnoticed into the streets. She's planned her escape carefully, and she has help. There's a very well-oiled machine in Philadelphia around the escape of slavery. Are you sure they won't talk? Don't worry. We made all the arrangements. It's all right. She'll need all the allies she can get. Washington will soon learn of her whereabouts in the North and devise a plan to covertly kidnap her. He writes letters to get her back with the understanding we can't, we don't want to make a big thing about this. It has to be done secretively because he knew it'd be very embarrassing. But Ona learns of the kidnapping plot and begins the unprecedented move of negotiating with the president. She states that I will return, but you may not enslave my children. And Washington is furious. You know, he doesn't negotiate with slaves. And she doesn't come back. Rather than risk embarrassment, Washington drops his kidnapping plans. And Ona never sees her family again. Throughout his life, Washington did nothing to abolish the institution of slavery. But upon his death, he makes one final gesture. Washington is deeply concerned uh, with his image in history. He desires secular immortality. He wants to be on the right side of history. And he knows a slaveholder is on the wrong side. He tackles this in his final document, his long will that he writes by himself. In this document, he decrees that all his slaves be freed and provided with education. But there's a catch. The orders are to be carried out only after the death of his wife. However, Martha is now worried that the slaves have a vested interest in her death, so she frees them early. Washington's relationship with slavery is a complex one. Its impact can be felt in every aspect of his life, including a grisly connection to his famous false teeth. Washington bought 
some uh, teeth from his slaves. It is a grisly fact uh, that he did this. It kind of gives you an image of slavery that we don't think about. But more than Washington's teeth are obscured by myth. Over the years, painters exaggerate and embellish every feature on his face. In life, Washington is a powerful figure, enduring countless hardships. But the greatest test of his strength and fortitude comes during his final hours. A winter storm overtakes Washington while he's out riding his Mount Vernon estate. He retires to his bedroom with a sore throat. As his airways begin to close, doctors are summoned to his bedside. But their treatment only makes the situation worse. The most surprising thing about Washington's death, I think that many people don't realize, is that it was a terribly painful and awful death. The Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia, holds a collection of the actual medical devices used to treat him on his deathbed. Bleeding was the most common medical procedure done during this time period. It was a part of the consideration that the body was a lot like a set of scales, and any sickness or illness of the body felt that the body was out of its proper balance. To restore balance, 18th century doctors commonly bled their patients using a device called a scarifier. And this is the actual tool that was used to bleed Washington by placing on the neck, cocked back, and the trigger would be pulled, and the blades would come out and lacerate the skin, get the blood flowing. Experts believe Washington suffered from epigoditis, a closing of the throat. Instead of helping, the loss of blood sent his body into shock. He dies late that evening with his wife, Martha, by his side. When they could do no more and Washington breathed his last, one of the doctors went to this clock that was sitting on the bedside table and stopped the clock at 1020, which is when Washington breathed his last. After his death, the realities of Washington's life become obscured by folklore. Legend replaces fact, and countless biographers seek to romanticize his life and personality. But in canonizing Washington, many believe they do disservice to the man behind the myth. I think one of the saddest parts of what's happened with the mythologizing of Washington is that to most Americans, uh, he's something of a bore. Flaws and all, this is a man of passion and ambition who has a lot to say even to our own day. Those things have been really lost behind the figure on the dollar bill. That is the worst image of Washington that has ever been constructed. He looks like an old fuddy-duddy. And if we had any brains, we would take another painting of Washington, like one by Charles Wilson Peale. There's the Washington that won the war, this tall, tough guy with this tiny little smile playing on his lips and a very, very direct look in his eye. Washington and those who have filtered his life may have succeeded too well his personality has been lost behind an iconic veneer. Only now, after more than two centuries, can we see him as he truly was. A flawed leader who overcame childhood tragedy, youthful recklessness, and lost love to achieve lasting greatness. This is the real George Washington, the founding father we hardly knew.